Good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening for those of you who are uh, connecting from uh, overseas. Uh, my name is Benedetta Audia, and I am a partner at uh, DLA Piper. For those of you who don't know, it's uh, one of the largest law firms in the world. Uh, and at DLA Piper, I chair the international development practice. Um, I'm based in, uh, in New York City. Um, I actually find, you know, I um, consider myself more of a UN colleague because I just left the UN uh, in December of last year. So it's very nice to be surrounded by, uh, by old uh, UN colleagues and uh, as well as old and new friends. Uh, it is a pleasure uh, to moderate today's panel on the maturity model to support trust in blockchain solutions. Uh, I am joined uh, by a number of colleagues here. I'm going to introduce them, and then I'm going to give them the floor so that they can say a little bit about, they can talk a little bit about themselves. Uh, Dino De Lacho is, um, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Benedetta. My name is Dino De Lacho. I'm the Chief Information Officer of the United Nations Joint Staff Pension Fund, and I'm also the co-chair of the Dynamic Coalition on Blockchain Assurance and Standardization here at the IGF. Uh, my name is Eugene Morozov, and I'm a member of the Government Blockchain Association, representing a number of developer companies, including uh, Governance, uh, GOSH, uh, Central Bank Digital Currencies, uh, Broxus, um, Undisputable Elections, uh, Devote, and uh, Blockchain-Based Security Card, uh, EverX. I am very pleased to be here. Thank you. Uh, hi, my, my name is Michael Hinson. I am the chair of the Intellectual Property Working Group of the Government Blockchain Association. I'm also a partner at the law firm of Perkins Coie, and I work in their uh, blockchain and fintech practice group. And my name is Shauna Hoffman, and I'm the president of Guardrail Technologies, and we are a generative AI company. Uh, thank you. I would like to ask the colleagues who are online to also introduce themselves. Gerard, would you like to start? Certainly. Uh, my name is Gerard Dashay. I'm the executive director of the Government Blockchain Association. I also am the co-lead with uh, Dino for the uh, Dynamic Coalition on Blockchain Assurance and Standardization. And it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Gerard. Uh, Paul, are you online with us? Yes. Uh, hello. Uh, I'm not sure why my name's showing up as Gerard, but um, I'm Paul Dowding, uh, co-founder and head of design for Alpharest Core, and our differentiating uh, layer one protocol called Tapestry X. I've been an active member of the GBA for four years and head up the banking and finance working group. And also have worked with Gerard and many of our colleagues here on the uh, blockchain maturity standard and, and also the banking and finance supplement. Thank you. Amelia, are you also there? I don't hear. Lori, are you there with us? Yes, hi there. Uh, so thank you very much for inviting us. My name is Lori Souza. I am a member of the Government Blockchain Association and also part of the working group for the blockchain maturity model. Uh, I'm an assessor and a consultant. Uh, we are putting together the uh, blockchain maturity model assessment. Uh, and uh, very happy to be here. Oh, also a member of the Standards and Certifications Committee and Land Titling and Digital Asset Management. Thank you, Laurie. Thank you for having us. Uh, Priya, are you there? Alejandro, are you there? Okay, um, I think uh, I'm just gonna start with a few questions. Uh, Dino, why don't you talk to us about the genesis of the model and uh, how it provides trust? Thank you, Benedetta. So the genesis of the blockchain uh, maturity model uh, was born from an idea of uh, uh, the president, uh, Gerard Ache, that introduced himself a few seconds ago of the Government Blockchain Association. And uh, the idea was that given the relative novelty of blockchain technologies, uh, especially governments that do not have 
uh, adequate experience and uh, um, skills in their team to uh, assess, appreciate, evaluate the um, reliance uh, of blockchain solution or even the ability to uh, develop a blockchain solution in-house. So as a result of that, um, rather than trying to establish from the beginning a, a strict standards or um, requirement for certification, the idea was to uh, develop a maturity model that would enable an organization to assess uh, the level of maturity of blockchain solution and also at the same time determine what could be the potential evolution of, of, uh, of the solution itself. So bringing together subject matter experts from uh, different sectors of industry, such as finance and banking, such as a legal, such as a voting, uh, digital identity, supply chain, um, we created a group that together co-author the blockchain maturity model, which is a model that is technologically agnostic, meaning that it can be applied to any platform, to any solution that uh, supports and provides blockchain services, but at the same time allows an organization through 11 domains and through five levels of maturity to uh, assess and determine what is the specific status, if you will, as enabled fundamentally to take a snapshot of a blockchain and therefore determine whether uh, more controls are required vis-a-vis -vis the strategic goals and uh, the ultimate objective of an organization. Thank you, Dino. Uh, Eugene, uh, can you talk to us a bit more about what a BMM assessment entails? Yes. Um, so it is very important to understand um, the pain points that the um, users of the model eventually will be able to address with. Um, and that is, there is a variety of private sector solutions that are being put forward today. And uh, people claim that they resolve a particular aspect of a particular issue. But uh, most uh, government officials and users are not very technically advanced to be able to determine themselves whether they can rely on certain claims that are being put forward. So uh, BMM has been designed as a mechanism, as a tool to help such people understand what the reality is, where they can turn to in order to reduce the risk that they're facing by inviting a particular uh, blockchain solution into their everyday life to solve their everyday problems. So a group of experts, a group of assessors behind uh, BMM is uh, exactly trying to help those officials to understand, to help them understand where they can rely on, to help them really solve the issue that they're solving with minimizing their risk. So the idea was to assemble representatives of all needed aspects which relate to a particular blockchain solution so they can spend some quality time analyzing what's being proposed from a variety of perspectives, as Dina mentioned a minute ago. Uh, there are all kinds of angles that one has to look at in order to assist and advise a user on the proper use of a blockchain. So the role of this group is to help. Thank you. Um, Mike, uh, why should a company go through an assessment? And it's kind of building upon what Eugene just said. You know, the, the underlying technology behind blockchains have been around for a very long time, but blockchain itself is, a rel is relatively new. And so there's a lot of education that needs to go on so for people to really understand how a blockchain architecture works. So you have a lot of blockchain solutions that have been out there that tout certain aspects. Um, they don't all live up to what they say they're going to be. And so we think it's important that the, the public and the stakeholders that are involved really understand the robustness of a certain solution. So you, you're going to have the developers, the users, potential a company that might need some capital investment. So these stakeholders need to understand, um, you know, is 
how, how solid is this blockchain? So uh, people have alluded to this. We've created 11 criteria when you're talking about is it scalable? Is it really decentralized? Does it ensure privacy? What happens in unforeseen eventualities? Is it still going to be up and running? These are important things that a blockchain solution must have. And so, and, and all these stakeholders have a vested interest in, in that. So we have a rating that gives them an, an objective perspective on, on just that. Um, I'm going to ask Shana a question, but then I would like to leave the floor to the colleagues online. Um, uh, Shana, can you talk to us about the supplements that are being created, especially those focusing on artificial intelligence? Yeah. Thank you, Pendana. Uh, it's really important as we look at the blockchain maturity model to start to look at the other technologies that really are part of the ecosystem that blockchain works with. And one of those is artificial intelligence. And there have been a lot of challenges that we have been addressing with artificial intelligence, especially now that the technology has been provided for free to many across the world. I mean, there were billions of users <laughs> uh, on, uh, of course, ChatGPT and other AI programs, and the world is really seen the power of those solutions. Now, unfortunately, also have people that we really never wanted <laughs> to have this powerful solution in their hands. So there are some challenges like malicious use that we've seen, privacy concerns. There is bias and discrimination, especially when it comes to the data in and the data out. Um, economic disruption uh, at various levels. And then, of course, those quality control changes. So as we have been building out the AI, what we're calling the AI BMM, so that blockchain maturity model, short is BMM for that, um, organizations can implement, um, maintain, and continually improve their AI solutions through this model and demonstrate that they can be trusted. Now, I am a big believer, and I don't know if anyone caught our last panel, in the combination of artificial intelligence and blockchain in being extremely powerful. What it allows us to do, what, you know, blockchain originally was for traceability and transparency. And AI really needs that partner. It needs a marriage with a system that has a ledger that can provide that transparency and traceability. One of the concerns with AI, of course, has always been the black box. Where did the data come from? We don't know. I mean, there's a lot of lawsuits trying to uncover what that is, but 17, tri it's, what was it? 17 terabytes of data, I believe it was, is what ChatGPT was, was um, you know, trained on. What were the 17? Is, is it inclusive of all of us around the world? You know, we heard yesterday in one of the, the sessions, 2.6 billion people aren't even using the internet. And there's a big push on internet for all. Those 2.6 billion people are not, their data is not in any of our systems right now. So we have AI being trained on only what, you know, a very small portion of the world. We're missing a lot of people. And so as we start to build out this um, AI BMM, we'd love your support. I see everyone in the room kind of shaking your heads, being concerned. Um, AI standards are extremely important. You know, we can transform this world in remarkable ways and make sure that everyone is included. Thank you, Shana. Uh, Lori, uh, can you still hear us? Hello, how are you? <laughs> Very well. So, thank you so much for the answer there, Shauna. That that was that's amazing insight. And uh, as we uh, mature the blockchain maturity model, we're looking at industry specific uh, BMM professionals uh, and assessors. And uh, with the AI supplement, it's going to be very important uh, to rate some blockchain solution providers uh, uh, with that expertise in mind. Um, so I'm going to ask Gerard then. Uh, Gerard, would you be able to tell, uh, tell our listeners why is blockchain so important for the next generation of the web? Well, Besides the AI concerns. Right. Well, I, I think one of the biggest challenges the world is facing right now, and, and AI is basically just demonstrating it, right? But it's trust. You know, if we look at uh, our, our elections and, uh, you know, all of the all the drama that comes around, that, that the, the, the losers uh, don't trust that they actually lost, right? If we look at the, the bank and financial crisis we had, right? Banks were too big to fail and 
uh, you think of all of that drama we had that it was because we we don't trust we 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 we've lost trust in health in healthcare, right? We don't trust our doctors. You know, with just look at what happened with with, with COVID, right? Everything became politicized, and we look at news, we look at deep fakes. The whole world, uh, you know, if you think about the UN SDG as it relates to uh, uh, to peace and and justice and and uh, strong institutions, if you lose trust, societies break down, right? And and blockchain is such an important component of that. However, here's the problem. Just like with the internet bubble, when um, uh, when that new technology came out, everybody went, went racing to the technology, but they never really took care of the fundamentals. Yeah. Right? So, so just like, well, if you look at blockchain from 2017 to 2022, 75% of those blockchain projects failed, right? Because people were racing towards the hype, right? And they were going to put everything on blockchain. I'm going to put haircuts on blockchain, right? Everything was blockchain, blockchain, blockchain. And uh, but but they lack the the maturity of some of these industries like the bank and financial services industry that have been around for hundreds of years, right? Paul can can speak to to that about the the the, the difference between these industries that are mature and these industries that are chasing after the hype and everybody's trying to make a quick buck and and, and investors are excited and tons of money gets thrown at it and it all collapses. So. Blockchain, I believe, is one of the most transformational technologies of our time because just like the internet, the internet was about the, the peer-to-peer movement of information, right? I could take something, I could copy it and give it to you. Now, you have a copy and I have a copy. So we can communicate, great. But blockchain is about the peer-to-peer movement of value. So that's why I can send you a cryptocurrency because I'm not double spending it. Now, now you have it and I don't have it anymore, right? And so this is a tremendously transformative. It comes at a time when there is a fundamental loss of trust in society and the blockchain maturity model, I think is going to keep this thing from going off the rails. So sorry, that was long winded, but that's, uh, that's why I think this is important. No, that, that's very important. Just, just like you said, uh, you send me in the uh, web two technology right now, uh, internet, you send me a copy. I send somebody else a copy. So we have several copies of the same document, but with blockchain, the solution is, that we have a one uh, place of storage where all of us can access the same document. We don't need to send that document around. Uh, and so, but that document's not centralized. So Paul, would you be able to explain how that document now with blockchain technology solves the problem of, uh, let's say, uh, being you know, trust and uh, being the correct document? in blockchain rather than storing uh, any of our copies up in the cloud or all of us storing our copies up in the cloud. Sure, sure. I'd just like to clarify something that um, despite my looks, I, I haven't been involved in the banking and finance industry for hundreds of years, but I can attest to some of the more recent events. Um, uh, I would say um, the, the thing, the, mis- the mistake that um, is often made with, with blockchain is it, it, often people bandy the word it's immutable. It really is. It really is mutable. It's very hard to corrupt, but it's really a corrupt evidence system. So it's not that it's going to guarantee uh, correctness, or um, you know, uh, it can it can ensure some credibility and it can create some control to direct and prove things. But when you've got a record that is corrupt evidence, you've got an audit and transparency of what has been you know done or has been said. So. It's not that you can guarantee that, say, the document is actually the right document, but you can find out whether it is or it isn't uh, based on the history. And that's that's really that it gives you that auditability and transparency. And um, rather than being dependent on central authorities or, or, or other intermediaries, you push the control to the edge where you're where the, the actual uh, instigators with within a network are in control of their data and therefore they they can see what it's what it's doing and how how it can be interpreted um and that's not just for the sake of shauna we have to worry about ai but we also have to worry about the seven or eight billion versions of natural intelligence that are attacking these networks as well um and that's part of the part of the uh, control and corrupt evident thing that we can create the transparency and auditability Okay, thank you, Paul. And I see that we have Amelia that's joined us. Amelia, are you available to answer a question or can you hear me? 
Yes, I am. Sorry, I had okay. some connection issues, so that we got those solved. So well, I'm we're glad you. Now. Glad you're here. Thank you. Uh, so yeah. we're. Um, I'm not sure at what point you joined us, but uh, we're uh, of course discussing the blockchain maturity model. Uh, can yeah. you tell us of the uh, maybe uh, industry specific uh, that you're involved with when coming when considering the blockchain maturity model? And, and Lori, yeah, so, uh, really, really quick, you're in a very unique position. So if you could talk about from the role of government, you know, why and how yeah. governments like yours would be interested in, in the, the BMM. Yeah, so, so that's what I was going to say. So I'm actually not in industry. I'm actually an elected official and I'm in government and we utilize uh, blockchain for uh, for several different things in our county. We, we utilize it for marriage licenses um, and creating certified digital documents for marriage certificates. Uh, as well as for voting for overseas and military members and people with disabilities. But one of the issues that we particularly face in government is when we put out um, a, a request for, for purchasing, oftentimes in government, because we're we tend to be a very low risk industry, if you will, um, we'll say things like we, when you were, when you reply to this, this, uh, with your sales package, we want 10 years experience in government, or we want you to give us um, the last seven projects you worked on in government. And when you're dealing with an emerging technology like blockchain, there just simply isn't anyone that has 10 years experience working in government, or there isn't anyone with seven government projects that deal with this technology and blockchain. And so the blockchain maturity model is a way for us to be able to gauge and judge whether a company can do what they say they can do when they don't have a decade of experience in that, right? So as I look forward to looking for providers, uh, I can't use the regular clause of give me your last seven government projects and give me you know 10 years experience working in government. What I then have to say is, well, give me a third party assessment of your of your product and let me know that it's a viable product and the blockchain maturity model does that you know so we can recommend we want a third party assessment of your product and your viability um, and we can recommend that they utilize the blockchain maturity model to do that so from a government official standpoint it really is a good way for us to judge an emerging technology since we can't use our standard processes to do that uh, thank you, Amelia. Um, I was uh, hoping you could introduce yourself uh, because um, this is what we did at the beginning. Uh, yeah. Um, so, as uh, as they said, my name is Amelia Powers Gardner. I'm currently a county commissioner serving in Utah County, Utah. Um, a county commission form is kind of like a city council and a mayor combined into one. Um, and our coverage area is about 750,000 people. Um, and as the commission chair, I basically serve as the, as the mayor for my, for my region. Uh, prior to that, I was the county clerk auditor for several years. So I ran elections, marriage licenses, and budgeting for the county. Um, and then prior to that, I worked for, at Caterpillar for 12 years um, as a field service engineer, a continuous product improvement engineer. And in um, and in marketing for parts. Thank you, Amelia. It was really important to have your perspective as a government official, and I couldn't agree more with your remarks about the importance on of relying on third party assessments, especially in circumstances where uh, governments, um, as custodians of taxpayers' funds need to make sure that right. there is a certain level of oversight and accountability. And so having that, you know, third-party uh, validation is super important to protect uh, governments from uh, reputational risks, performance risks, and legal risks, which are usually the kinds of risks that uh, institutions that handle public funds have to be um, uh, aware of and, and, and need to mitigate. Um, yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks again, Amelia. Um, I have a question about um, digital identity, Dino. 
Um, so the goal of uh, digital identity supported by blockchain solutions is to enable SSI, self-sovereign identity. Can you tell us how uh, blockchain solutions comply with the data protection laws? Thank you, Benedetta. So uh, first and foremost, I would like to, uh, to share my experience in, uh, in the GBA and in adopting uh, the BMM, specifically in my case for uh, a digital identity solution. Uh, I think the value proposition of having a non-profit association that works on this, uh, in this area is actually that it was able to bring together practitioners. Like Emilia just said, uh, she firsthand experienced the adoption of a blockchain solution to solve a practical problem in her county. For example, the issuance of marriage certificate, especially I remember her telling our story during the period of COVID where people were not able to physically access public services. In my case, uh, my experience is that when I became chief information officer at the UN Pension Fund, I was presented with a 75 years old problem. And, and this was the, the problem that the pension fund on a yearly basis needs to prove that those who are receiving the benefit, the payments, are still alive. And the uniqueness of the United Nations Pension Fund is that it has 84,000 retirees in 192 countries around the world. And as you can appreciate, determining and confirming that uh, these 84,000 people are still alive, it's quite a challenge. And also, we can also appreciate that uh, inevitably, in some cases, there could be potential for, for fraud. So the way for 75 years that the pension fund addressed this problem was to send a form, a piece of paper, using 192 postal services around the world, asking the beneficiary to sign and return this form as a proof that they are still alive. Now, aside from the fact that using 192 postal services created a lot of problem, often this piece of paper got lost. Most uh, frequently they were received with delays, and of course this had an impact both on the operation of the pension fund as well as on the livelihood of, of the beneficiary, because when the pension fund did not receive this form, after two attempts, they had to stop the payment. So there was always this level of uncertainty from the beneficiary side as, did they receive the form? Am I going to receive the money next month? So forth and so on. So the, the, this issue was presented to me as the only process that within the pension fund of the UN had never been automated. And the problem was that the pension fund was often questioned by its governing bodies, by its oversight bodies, as to how can you prove that there is no fraud? And of course, proving a negative is impossible. So the only way that I could try to address this challenge was, okay, let's prove a positive. So we work on designing and implementing an application that uses biometrics, facial recognition, with a blockchain, creating an immutable ledger where each step of this process from the initial onboarding to the various payments that are made during the month and through the various instances where people are proving that they are still alive are recorded on this immutable ledger so that we can also prevent collusion. So that nobody can say, well, there is someone within the pension fund that went into the system and maybe uh, uh, manipulated the record as uh, Paul Dowding was referring to because the blockchain, even though you may try to attempt to manipulate the data, the, the, the evidence it remains on the general ledger. So through this system in January 2021, we went live. We deployed the system and now 35,000 retirees of the pension fund have an application on their phone that they have downloaded. They went through an onboarding process where they captured a biometric profile on their phone only. So their biometric profile is not stored in any server of the United Nations, and it's not transmitted in any way on any office of the United Nations, remains on their phone after being onboarded by a representative of the pension fund. So the beauty is now they can use the phone to confirm for now once a year, but the frequency can change at any time, that they are still alive. And we have a proof, a tangible proof on the blockchain that, that this occurred. Now going to apologies for giving this long background, but I think 
enable us to put issue into context. So when it comes to complying with data privacy, aside from the fact that the United Nations is not subject to national legislation, nonetheless, the United Nations tried to align itself to the principle that are adopted by various countries around the world in order to make sure that uh, we are consistent with the expectation of what we call the, ta the taxpayers of the world to whom we are ultimately accountable to the General Assembly, the 193 country that are represented there. So the point being here is that we are very much aware of, for example, the data privacy principle, the GDPR, or the European Union, or other legislation across the world that fundamentally share more or less the same concept of transparency, independence, and verifiability, and many other uh, principles. And by creating a blockchain in, in, an, in alignment with a concept of self-sovereign identity, we created a system where the user is in control of his or her identity because they have their biometric profile on their device, they are confirming when they are alive or not. We are not in a position to manipulate or to use or to act on their behalf. And ultimately, we are not putting any personal identifiable information, any PII, on the blockchain itself. So there is a misconception that people think that private data, when talking about digital identity, are stored on the blockchain. And that's not the case. On the, on the blockchain, there are information related to addresses that are connected to the public keys of each individual uh, that has been created with a digital identity that then are recorded on the blockchain. But the information itself, date of birth, name, last first name, last name, uh, information about the pension detail are never recorded on the blockchain itself. And in this way, we are avoiding all the concern, all the risk that uh, are identified into privacy laws and regulation. D do you mind if I just add a quick? I was about to ask you a follow-up <laughs> question, so please go ahead. Mike. I, I I'm just my phone. <laughs> I don't know if it's the same question, but but I suspect maybe Dino, you can comment on this that that the that the fact that there's a blockchain running under the hood is the users don't really know that they don't understand the underlying architecture. They're not aware of it, and I think. I think there's a lot of applications that are, that are developing today that are utilizing blockchain technology uh, that the average consumer doesn't know that that's running behind the scenes. But maybe you can comment on that with respect to the pension fund. Yes, absolutely. A and indeed, uh, as, you, as you're alluding to, uh, the beauty of processes of this nature that uh, are transparent to the end user. And actually, what we encountered at the very beginning when we went live with the application was that people were very concerned. First of all, because they heard the term bio, uh, biometrics. Second of all, because they heard the term blockchain and automatically they start thinking about cryptocurrency, about Bitcoin, about proof of work, about the exploitation of natural resources because as, uh, as you read from the news, Bitcoin and the proof of work are mechanisms that uh, uh, create uh, and consume a lot of energy. So we had to engage in a campaign to actually explain and to reassure our end user that they did not need to worry because we were using blockchain for different purposes. The blockchain is different than Bitcoin, although it's the technology that it's adopted. And therefore, there was a process of, if you will, awareness and education, but at the same time, a process of reassurance to make sure that, that they did not have to know the nitty gritty detail. Hence the need for a BMM or for independent verification that uh, basically give them that uh, level of trust and assurance. Shana? Yeah, no, and what you've described is probably one of the best use cases I've ever heard for AI and blockchain and how they work together. Because only with blockchain can you mask the individual's information and it doesn't have to go into the blockchain. So it doesn't go into the ledger, but AI can be used to provide facial recognition, some really powerful, powerful components, that all stays at the end user. So I'm still in control of my data, but what happens is blockchain can actually be the log for that data and can provide, of course, those tokens. So we won't get into those details, but it's a really great combination use case that, you've, um, that you're doing. Awesome. Eugene? Yes, uh, and then to take this one step further, 
uh, let's talk about the art of the possible, what can be coming next. So if you add to, let's say, biometric identification that is used uh, by Dina's group right now, if you add to that uh, a blockchain-based security card and a combination of other identification factors and you uniquely identify an individual, that opens a variety of further possibilities. First and foremost, governance how those people can govern the society that they live in, not only in the financial applications where receiving their pensions, for example, but also expressing their will in elections, right, which are probably having the m need for the most secure environment and for the most safe environment. We want people to be able to safely express their will so it becomes possible as part of general governance. Then if you add a uh, frequent requirement by constitutions of many countries of uh, true anonymity of the person voting, and you add uh, what's called zero-knowledge technology, which is available today as a result of a uh, number of scientific breakthroughs of the recent years, you can um, have people express their will in a truly anonymous way, which is incredible. Then if you add that to the uh, central banks, uh, central banks can interact directly with individuals without any financial intermediaries to allow uh, people to have essential accounts with central bank of their uh, country, and therefore the whole financial industry is going to go through very serious transformation because of that, because again, the role of intermediaries, intermediaries will uh, be uh, significantly reduced. So all of that is coming, and uh, we should be cognizant and we should be aware of the new recent advances in technology and utilize them. So the blockchain maturity model allows users to make their steps um, more confidently with less risk and ultimately improving the way we govern ourselves and our societies. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to follow up on some of the comments that Mike uh, was making earlier and ask you about potential risks in relation to claims and disputes in this area. What are your thoughts? It's it's quite broad, but I mean we've all we've been talking about you know all the positive aspects of the model, but if there ever was a claim, what would you think that would focus on and how? As a, an attorney, would you advise your client? Well, there, there's a lot. There's a lot to that. But let me just tell you some of the issues that we're seeing, like in in the law firm, when it comes to blockchains. And we talked about this a little bit in our previous session. Um, you know, you want to obviously make sure that the data you have is has not been uh, has not been tampered with. Um, but a lot of what blockchains are doing, they're storing data, and then you have AI engines that are coming in, like ChatGPT, that's taking that data and creating new results from it. Um, and w there's there's uh, there's authors or creators of that underlying data that theoretically, uh, you know, they, they created it, and and was it faithfully put on the blockchain, as Paul was alluding to, you can you can track the provenance of and the history of something, but you can't actually confirm the underlying accuracy of the data that was put on there in the first place. So um, with, with blockchain, you can, uh, you can at least when it comes to content creation, track what is happening and, and when for copyright and authorship, you can give attribution for people's works that are being used. Um, and so, and when it comes to privacy, you know, I, I, I have the right to the publicity of myself and my own privacy. And, and blockchain can help further that objective because now I can, I can trace my data that was on the blockchain and the extent to which it has been used by somebody perhaps surreptitiously and, and I can track it back to my own personal data. We're seeing a lot in, uh, I think there's gonna be a lot of uh, lawyers that continue to be productive <laughs> because of the legal issues that are arising out of blockchain um, when it comes to some of these issues. I, I track, um, uh, just internally within my firm, the th on from the patent side, I'm a patent attorney uh, predominantly, and I track um, all the blockchain-related patents around the world. And what I'm what I'm seeing is, you know, you can't patent blockchain in and of itself, but you you patent what what a lot of people are doing is the intersection of blockchain AI and IoT. I'd add that to this discussion. 
um, and there are so many interesting use cases. And we're, we're in an environment that's, that's in, in, in many respects, very open source and philanthropic in its nature. But I can assure you there are companies that are investing a lot of money to protect their blockchain solutions um, because they all want to play in the same sandbox and there's going to be consolidation in the space. So we are just now starting to see patent infringement actions coming out because some of these blockchain-related patents um, have, you know, they were filed several years ago they've since issued and now there are people that are infringing them so i think i've tracked about three or four lawsuits that have just come uh on patent infringement related to blockchain thank you Benedetta? yes i was Benedetta. about to give you the floor gerard uh, th thank you um i, I want to make sure that we cover uh the, the the topic of what this panel is is about which is um uh, how can blockchain maturity models be used we're covering a lot of really important ground uh, on, on identity and, uh, and IP and stuff. But I'd like to take a minute and uh, I can share a video. We, we have about a minute, minute and a half video on what the BMM is because we, we've talked about it, but I don't think we've really explained what it is. Uh, so I, I'd be happy to share my video or, or maybe we can just take a few minutes to, to explain what the BMM is. Would that be all right? Uh, sure, sure. Um, would you like to, uh, do we share the video from right. here or? Okay. Um, I think I can share it. I think I can share it from here. Let, okay. Let's give that a shot. Let's try. And if it doesn't, if, if it doesn't work, then uh, then we'll just explain it. But let's give this a shot. Are you involved in the blockchain and Web three space? If so, listen to this. There's this awesome thing called the blockchain maturity model that you need to know about. It's designed for individuals and organizations to evaluate blockchain solutions by leveraging their expertise in blockchain, Web3, and digital assets. As the interest in blockchain solutions is growing among governments, enterprises, investors, and donors, they're spending money on various blockchain projects. But there's a catch. Just like the internet bubble, many of these projects end up failing. So the challenge here is to find a reliable and trustworthy solution amid all of the overhyped vaporware that's out there. And that's where the VMM comes into play. It's a framework created by the GBA, a nonprofit organization with members in 500 government offices around the world. And the model is showcased by the UN Internet Governance Forum, Dynamic Coalition on Blockchain Assurance and Standardization, as a way to help assess blockchain solutions and achieve two very important goals. It provides a roadmap for solution developers to create and maintain trustworthy blockchain solutions. It gives confidence to potential customers, investors, and other stakeholders looking to invest in blockchain projects. The BMM is already being used by various public and private sector organizations in different industries. Now, here's the exciting part. The organizations implementing the BMM need experts to help them with the process. By joining the GBA, taking the training, and becoming an authorized BMM consultant or assessment team member, you can play a vital role in enhancing the trustworthiness of these solutions. This not only adds credibility to their projects, but it also gives you a chance to earn credentials and income. If you'd like to learn more, shoot an email to bmm at gbaglobal.org or check out the links in the description below. And we've got a couple of people on the, um, we've got a couple of people, let me just go to stop sharing, uh, on, on here that are uh, BMM assessors, uh, that had, that were involved in writing the model. Paul uh, was involved in writing the model from the very beginning. So maybe Paul, could you explain a little bit about uh, the the process uh, and and what some of the what some of the levels are? Because I don't think we talk about levels at all. And Alejandro is the lead assessor, or I'm sorry, Alejandro is an assessor. Maybe he could talk a little bit about the assessment process, because I think that information is going to be really important for somebody to understand how models can be used uh, to ensure the trustworthiness of, of blockchain solutions. Paul? Sure. Um, the, uh, the process was, I mean, as a team over 18 months to two years came together to, to say, how do we make this assessment model? And uh, we honed in the idea that there'd be elements to be assessed and then there'd be layers of maturity. Um, so there was a lot of back and forth and debate about what should be a unique element, but we, we honed in on, on um, the uh, 11 that came out. I'll quickly go through them. Distribution, governance, identity, interoperability, performance, privacy, reliability, resilience, security, infrastructure, sustainability, and synchronization. And, uh, and then with those, and I just two of those are pretty critical in some of the earlier conversations, resilience and infrastructure sustainability, because you don't just want to know that the data's got integrity, but the system will last as long as the life cycle needs it to, 
and and it has some resilience to to attack or or going you know downtime in terms of various nodes of the network. So those are two elements. Uh, so the group had to work on defining deciding what those elements were and then choosing their name, which was an interesting discussion, and even their definitions. Uh, and then we took those elements to look at the five layers, and really we're we're looking at all spectrums of maturity. We start with level one, which is an idea, which may be partially documented or partially implemented. Level So there's a sort of statement of intent rather than just something that works. Level two assessments is that it's documented. So this is a fully documented, you know, full requirement spec solution. The third one is that it's, it's validated. It's a proof of concept. So the, somehow the technologically the design's been proven. Fourth is that it's actually in production. And then fifth, we termed in terms of optimizing, which means that there's multiple instances or it's been running in various use cases uh, such that it's being developed and you know enhanced in its future state. Uh, at the moment, we're only doing level one assessments, just that even if people have, like we had, production-ready software, but we went for that level one assessment. Um, and But the, the process of defining what the requirements of those levels for each element, if you think about it, that's 11 times 5. So that's the minimum of 55 discussions. <laughs> there were many more over the 18 months of two years. To get it to refine, because um, I think it was uh, Dino said it earlier, the idea of the BMM was it's applicable for all types of blockchains, public, private, various use cases, applications, and otherwise. Um, and that's what led us to the supplements. But I'll let um, Alejandro explain uh, the assessment process. Alejandro, you, you want to talk, you, you've been involved in some uh, assessments, and those assessments are very different than audits um, and inspections. Do you want to talk a little, little bit about what a BMM assessment is? Yes, yes, sir. Oh, thank you very much. Hi, uh, guys. I'm Alejandro Mantujano. Uh, let me present first. Uh, I'm the lead of the Mexico chapter and the Latin America region uh, for GDA. Um, I'm certified a BMM as, uh, assessor. So let me tell you uh, how the process consists. So once we have the the uh, the, the, the uh, authorized program to start, we have to make the planning. In that part of planning, we have to define as 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 uh, uh, mentioned a team. The team is 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 uh, leaded by the assessor, the lead assessor, integrated by different members, certified assessors that. Uh, are specific for the for the process. So uh, we have the the, the domain uh, lead, with the domain member, which is specialized on the domain we're talking about. We are assessing. Then we have three different members, which are specialized in in domain. Yeah, uh, sorry about the uh, legal part, such uh, as mine. Then we have the digital assess the digital assets uh, specialist. Then we can have a distribution or even uh, someone from the identity uh, working group, so they can we, we can all uh, start uh, reviewing all the different procedures that the client present to us. So in a way that, uh, as Paul was saying, depending on the level, is the type of requirements that we we must fulfill. So if we have the, the the first level, which is the initial level, we have to have an idea, and things need to be assessed as uh, we have. Let them documented, planned, and even uh, that are mentioned by the uh, client to us. Then, once we have uh, that information, we get uh, a team re team reunions in which we gather all different uh, issues that we discovered in a way that we all cooperate among among, among us. So, uh, in that process, at the end, you have like different uh, 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 approaches that need to be maybe a point with the client. So we have uh, 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 meetings with them, with the client, and we start with different uh, uh, officials of the company, and we start reviewing pipe, 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 element by element and part by part of the different issues that we discover. So they have to be uh, defined and precise by the client. So uh, when we have find that there's something that they have to missed. Instead of saying it's a it's a yes or no that you are you are assessed, we we find like areas of opportunity. So we guide the clients to tell them, well, you have to do this, you have to do that in order to comply with the requirements, and they just get get that in as, as, as homework. So they start redefining really things or adjusting, and at the end we can present if, if the 
if everything is fine, we can give them a, uh, as, a as a consensus. We we give them a rating. So and, if they yeah, excuse me. Yeah, and, and Alejandro, I, I'd like to just tag on to something you said that's really important. Uh, an assessment is very different than an audit. Because one of the things that's a unique attribute of, of an assessment with this kind of model is that members of the solution being assessed are actually part of the assessment team. Because it's absolutely important to have a balance of objectivity and insight. You know, if you get, if you take your car to get inspected, right, they, they can tell you that the brake pads have to be, I don't, I don't know what the number is, three thirty seconds of, a, of an inch uh, thick. Because they've got millions of data points that say that when it drops below that, the car is unsafe, right? We don't have that in blockchain. In blockchain, the, 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 it's still very immature. So a, a, an assessment using this kind of a model is a collaborative process in which we we bring industry experts together. I mean, some you know the, the qualifications are, are very high. We bring industry experts together and we and they essentially are in partnership with the solution being assessed because our 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 uh, our model is that, the, the solution being assessed and the assessors both are combined and joined with the objective of maturing and making that solution better. So it's very, very different than anything I think that we've ever seen before. And I'd like to throw it over to, to Lori. Lori, can pretty much anybody jump on an assessment team or what, what are the qualifications to be on an assessment team? And then I, I'd like to throw it back to, to uh, Paul to see, you know, what, what value, this is one of the questions that that um, uh, Benedict, I know you were going to ask anyway. What are the what's the value that comes to uh, an organization that goes through an assessment? Well, Lori, why don't you talk a little bit about you know can anybody be on an assessment team or is there some process to go through? Well, that's a great lineup, uh, Gerard, of questions. So thank you uh, for uh, uh, handing that one to me. Uh, yeah. So in order to form a, a BMM assessment team the team member needs to go through the training process and there's some requirements before an assess an assessor can take place or take part of uh, an assessment. Uh, the first requirement is of course, uh, uh, well, the courses that GBA offers, which are BMM specific. Uh, we have three blockchain maturity model courses that are available and we're developing two more uh, but the, the courses go through a thorough understanding of what are the 11 elements that a blockchain solutions provider will be rated. Uh, and uh, those 11 elements then have five different levels of maturity, let's say, maturity ratings. So we have a, a level one, which would be somebody with an idea or a startup uh, with very limited uh, um, very limited, uh, let's say anything more than the idea and the documentation. Uh, and then we also have the full production level, which is all the way to the other end of the level five. And so it, it's a really comprehensive uh, maturity model that a blockchain solutions provider would go through. And we do have a real strong team that's that's been trained uh, and also trained in how to have an assessment. Uh, and then we have a lead assessor as well. And uh, Dino and Paul are uh, two of our lead assessors on the blockchain maturity model uh, team, and uh, as well as Gerard. Uh, so uh, we do uh, require the, that training to be done before somebody can actually become an assessor or even a blockchain consultant. So again, once somebody takes that training with the GBA, which is also the uh, the uh, Blockchain Assurance Coalition, uh, once somebody takes the training and is interested in becoming a, a blockchain maturity model advisor, they can also become a blockchain maturity model consultant. Uh, now that consultant is available for a blockchain solutions provider that doesn't have as much knowledge about the assessment. And so a lot of the solutions providers we're finding do need to have the help of, get, of readiness and preparation to uh, take part of an assessment. The Lori, assessment- uh, Lori, can I say, so that's, that's, that's an excellent point because this really applies to uh, the UN's uh, SDGs too, right? In terms of economic development. 
One of the yes. things that's really important about what Lori just said is that there are there are people all around the world that are looking for economic opportunity, right? And by developing blockchain skills, the nice thing about, about this is blockchain is global. So you can have somebody in Cameroon or Kenya developing these skills and providing consulting uh, opp opportunities and capabilities because blockchain is everywhere, right? It's, it's uh, ubiquitous. And so you, we can, if we think about this from an economic development perspective, we can get dollars globally into a local community because they have these skill sets. Well, that's not something we haven't really talked about uh, a, a lot. But the other thing that I, I think is really important to understand is if you're going to use a blockchain maturity model, anyone, you, the BMM or any other, uh, any other one, you don't have to do it with with the GBA. Uh, I'm not aware of other models. I think we're out in front. But if somebody wanted to develop a model, the one advice I would give them is make level one easy, right? Because I can't I can't tell you um, uh, how many people have thought that they have arrived. Right? We have people coming in the door all the time saying, oh, we're level five. We'll, we, yeah, we're we're going to do this thing just to kind of prove to the world how great we are because we're so great. Oh, by the way, let me tell you about the PhDs and all of these experts we have on our board and, and this math. And look, look, here's some white papers. And as soon as we peel the onion back, what we realize is they don't, they don't have the basics, right? They don't have, you know, uh, Paul could share some examples where, where, um, uh, somebody said, well, here's our, our schematics about our, our system. And they just, they, they had a lot of really, really cool stuff, but they just didn't include a blockchain, right? And they had just like forgotten to leave it off. And we would ask people, uh, what, can you identify what your critical components are and how you monitor the operational status of it? You know, crickets, de deers in the headlights. So I would, I would say that if somebody is going to use a model uh, to develop uh, trusted solutions. They've got to make the entry point easy. And I am shocked at how immature uh, this industry is. I'm, I'm completely shocked uh, about that. Paul, can you share just a little bit about what the value that, uh, that people get from these assessments? Maybe, maybe you can gener genericize some of the findings that would be beneficial to people that are building blockchain solutions. Sure. We'll go to um, Paul and then afterwards, Alejandro has a question or would sure. like to ask. Okay. Um, yeah, I think uh, I think it was uh, talked about at the beginning that really this is, I think Eugene made the point, this is a means for buyers of blockchain solutions to have a means of measuring or looking at this, uh, the use cases they're considering and, sorry, the solutions they're using and then their suitability for their use cases. And I think it also gives a credibility to um, uh, the solution providers uh, that they've they've actually gone through this process and reached assessment, and I think again a, a key thing about confidentiality is that uh, we're only uh, the GBA only publishes that your solution is there and it's reached this assessment, but part of the assessment process is actually to get a full feedback on each of the elements and or any supplemental requirements that were if you're considered those in the use cases. And that's to you as a solution provider, which then you can share. So that's information that's confidential to you, but you can now share it with your prospective um, investors and clients. And and I can say, you know, as representing a, a startup, this is another, you know, uh, arrow in our quiver that could, you know, is a credibility that we've actually gone through this process, and we can talk to the detail and thoroughness and objectivity of the assessment to allow people to understand uh, that, you know, we've met the, met the requirements of, of the elements. And that, that's, uh, I think that's a, a, I mean, it's a, that's a huge value to the solutions, but the idea that there's been an independent assessment for the buyers of solutions is, is another, uh, you know, a, a benefit to them. And those are the two great values. Alejandro? Yeah, uh, just to mention, George, that, uh, help the people uh, let them know that we have accomplished uh, quite different things that uh, regarding to how we uh, develop the uh, the BMM assessment we 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 have the uh, advantage of including in, in, in the working groups uh, competitors of the same domain of the same industry and and the same type of voting solution so when we uh, start assessing they uh one for example what company accepts to be uh, partially assessed by other by their competitor. 
So we have a true impact of the, of the of the of the real knowledge of the of the market of the domain. So we help each other in a way that we can instead of being uh, competitors outside the market, we can help us uh, better up our solutions. So one of the, I think it's one of the very best things that we have been doing. That's what you heard. Thanks. You know, it, it's an one of the things that's, it, that's fascinating about this. Oh, uh, one of the things that's fascinating about uh, this technology, this group is there are three characteristics that I think uh, represent the people in this group. They're out of the box thinkers, uh, they're willing to take a risk, and they're interested in something bigger than themselves. And when you look at the people that are building blockchain solutions and trying to solve problems that, that relate to you know, healthcare or hunger, poverty, uh, you know, many of these issues, right? E economic inclusion. Um, the, by and large, these are really, really good people. Now, the problem is there are also scammers out there, right? But by creating a culture where we can come together, uh, recognizing that the market and, and the problems are so huge, they're, they're much bigger than any one of us can, can, can do. By coming together and working together as a cohesive fabric, as a family, right? Bringing competitors together to, to see how can we work together to, for the rising tide to lift all ships. We can create a fabric of people and of technology to solve problems that some of our traditional institutions have struggled with for many years. And I and we had recently had the um, uh, one of the chief strategy. I, I don't remember his exact title. I think he's like the chief strategy and innovation uh, person at at, um, uh, at Oracle. Uh, and and so he said that he believes that the BMM is a game changer. And again, we. I th we we may be the only model right now. I don't. I'm not aware if there's others. We don't need to be. We really want to create an inclusive environment where if other people have models or want to build models, let's share. Right. Let's share the common vocabulary. We we use the vocabulary of the ISO organization uh, because that was there. But let's get let's get different organizations, different multi-stakeholder organizations together. Let's get the, uh, uh, the IADB that are working on lack chain and let's get these people together. Right. So that so that instead of us all building things in silo, we can create a common family, a common framework of uh, of, of standards. I think I think that's what the industry needs, and the and and the world needs us to mature blockchain because we're not mature yet. We can't solve all the problems that we want to solve because we don't have our own house in order. And we've got to get our own house in order so we can actually have the impact globally to make a difference. So with that, I, I apologize for monopolizing the. Uh, this, but I, I really wanted to get uh, some of those things out there. Well, that that's great. Thank you, Gerard. Uh, Paul, you have a question, or would you like to add to that? Uh, sure. Um, um, the one thing I was going to say, just to add to it, was um, I think someone made the point earlier. You know, the internet made communication pervasive because it was a, an inter a communication protocol. And but the technology is basically invisible. It's in the background. All we know is we clicked a link today, and we're all talking on a video link. Um, the distributed ledger technology in blockchains has the potential to be a transacting protocol, and therefore, what's going to happen is the technology is going to become invisible. You're going to be transacting. So the ability to truly assess the solution, you know, by the the people that need to know how to do that, and also, uh, again. Variations on the element, the performance or otherwise, can help you assess the solution to the use case. And I think that's a critical thing as well. Because So you've got those two things, because it is going to become invisible. And so the ability to really understand it, um, uh, because it's a very technical and diverse set of, of solutions, it, is becomes, it becomes critical for the, you know why the BMM is so important. I, and I'd like to hear from... Uh, uh, from Mike, because Mike has been involved in the legal um, aspect and also the uh, the digital asset management, a little bit about why that's important. Dino has been building out the identity management solution. So we have about 50 working groups that are all working on on different aspects. Sean has been involved in our AI supplement, right? And, and it, it's critically important to understand that all of these different pieces have to be built uh, independently, right? Because you have different skill sets, but they have to be built uh, in an integrated sort of uh, fabric uh, kind of way. So, uh, Dino, do you have any thoughts about um, how the, the identity management supplement kind of fits into the overall framework? Because you, you've been involved from the, gosh, pretty close from the very beginning. So, uh, just a little bit of a context before, 
the concept of a supplement is about qualifying the requirement of the blockchain maturity model. So having a maturity model that is technologically agnostic helps anybody to conduct an assessment of the maturity of a blockchain solution. However, with a supplement, we try to go beyond that, meaning that we are looking at the specific context of in which industry, in which sector, which problem is a blockchain intended to address. So we may have the use of a blockchain to support voting an election. We may have blockchain that are utilized to support supply chain. We, have, we may have blockchain supporting land and titling. Or we may have identity uh, and management and digital identity. So in preparing this supplement, we try to go beyond the core and foundational criteria that can and should be used to assess the maturity of blockchain by asking specific questions that only pertains to a specific sector. What are the risks of using a blockchain in identity management? What are the risks of using a blockchain in voting an election or in healthcare records management? So the supplement in digital identity has been developed. It is now almost 90% done. It will be issued by the end of this year. I'm speaking as a lead of that working group. And what we realize is that it's not just enough to go and identify the risk, but because of that level of relative immaturity about knowledge of blockchain, their functioning, their purpose, their risk, and their control, we realize that there is also a need to explain the, foundation, the foundational concept of each one of these use cases. So when we're talking about digital identity, we're talking about self-sovereign model. We're talking about selective disclosure. We're talking about verifiable credential. So we realize that in order for a team of assessor to appreciate the meaning and the benefit of using a maturity model, we also need to explain what are these foundational concepts that apply specifically to that domain. So the supplement on digital identity is being built with that approach. We have an appendix where we're explaining what are these foundational concepts, self-sovereign identity, verifiable credential, selective disclosure, zero knowledge proof, and then we have a body of requirement, of criteria that pertain, that relate to those foundational concepts so that both the assessment team as well as the, the team and the organization being assessed can put all this information into context and understand exactly the what, the why, and the how. Thank you. Uh, if I may just uh, add some color uh, to that. So uh, we remember that um, Amelia mentioned earlier today that the government officials kind of want um, a more safe and uh, secure and verified solutions to be uh, used, uh, yet the technology is so new that none of the teams uh, perhaps have the adequate number of government uh, work uh, uh, or uh, particular contracts that they did for the government. And on the other hand, the developer teams, they possess the knowledge and the understanding that is brand new in the world. So uh, BMM assessment, in my opinion, is very much a two-way process. On one hand, the government learns from what has become available due to technological breakthroughs in recent years. At the same time, the solution providers understand much better what is it that they need to do, both in terms of practical uh, abilities and in terms of documentation that is required for their solutions to become more wis widespread and uh, find um, uh, user acceptance in the world. That's why I think this work on its own is extremely valuable because this new technology finds its way to its users through a dialogue, through common interests, through um, sharing the thoughts and ideas and also the requirements of the practical government or private industry users. And it relates to the whole breadth of technologies that we are discussing here, from 
software supply chain security solutions such as Gosh, to uh, security cards such as Surf by Everax, to uh, voting uh, and uh, solutions by uh, Devote, and uh, to central bank digital currencies issues that Brox has developed. So this process is creative. This process is very challenging and amazing. So I would encourage all the users to approach um, a government blockchain association and uh, join the process of developing our common knowledge and our common products. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Eugene. Uh, any other questions from the for tho from those who are connected online? Let's see. I have a I have a question um, here for one of our panelists, and uh, who would ever like to to answer it? And uh, it is why would. Uh, why is it important for a blockchain solutions provider to go through this assessment? It, can I re can I respond to that? Yes, I think you did earlier. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, um, give, me, give me one minute uh, because one of let, uh, let me tell you the story about one of the um, uh, one of the organizations that, that went through an assessment. Uh, so. Uh, in fact, if, if we, we have a listing of companies that have successfully uh, gone through the um, the assessment, so when they are uh, assessed, they um, uh, they're, they're listed on a directory of uh, trusted blockchain solutions. But let me sh rather than me tell you, let me let the the president of that company tell you directly. So I'm going to share my screen and show you this guy. All right, let's see. So let let me just explain. Uh, this is a this right here is the president of. Uh, we, can you guys see my screen? Yeah, this guy here is the president of a company called uh, Access, and uh, they work in the casino industry. So there's a lot of money laundering that happens in casinos. So they built an IoT device that goes in the handle, so that whenever somebody pulls the handle, it writes the transaction to a blockchain, and this way the regulators can know that it, it it's fair, it's transparent, that there wasn't any money laundering going on. So they came to us and they said, hey, we, we want an assessment. And um, it was amazing as we went through this, we, you know, uh, over the period of time, we exposed to them the vulnerabilities in their own system, right? And so we delivered the findings. Uh, Alejandro was, was there and, and some of these other folks. But these were the words out of his mouth the, the minute we finished delivering the findings. And this answers the question of, of of what the value is. So let me just uh, share his words. Is again, it's about a minute and a half. Uh, except to share have... the volume and walk yeah. access being said um, for the team that has put this together, built the process and walked access through this. It is nothing short of incredibly impressive. Um, when Nick would come out of a meeting and he'd share what he learned, what he went through, it goes to show that there's, oh, I'd say thousands of hours of accumulated work to get us to this point. And probably the most important part I'd like to say is I'm trying to hide my smiles and stuff, but <laughs> I'm really, really proud of this. Uh, this is an exciting moment. Uh, leadership is from the front, folks. So... The fact that Gerard, we were able to get access through this with your with your team, is a great way to get GBA to the next step of ensuring that the world embraces this amazing certification. So, uh, I'm very proud of Access, but at the same time, I'm equally as proud and thankful to the GBA team. And so he is also the president of the International uh, uh, Gaming Standards Association. And so uh, one of the things that he wants to do is because of the, the challenges in the, the gaming industry, he wants to take the, the BMM, well, first blockchain because of all the problems it can solve, and then BMM because it can, it can verify that blockchain is solving the problems. He wants to take that to the entire gaming industry. So as, as we are encountering uh, more and more organizations and they're going through the process, what the BMM does is it, it shines a spotlight on, on the problems so they can fix it. And then the BMM team, it works with them collaboratively 
to, to help them fix it. So at the end of the day, we have better, more trusted blockchain solutions. And that's what this panel is really all about, is, is how can these models be used to, uh, to effectively get trusted blockchain solutions? Uh, thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, Mike, I, I believe he has a question for you know. Yeah, I just wanted to, to, to raise something that we really haven't talked about. I mean, we're sitting here at the UNIGF and we have north of 190 countries being represented here. There's also a jurisdictional component to this BMM model and some of the supplements that we've done, especially when it relates to privacy. You know, people have their own privacy laws in different countries. So I don't know if, if Dino, you experienced this directly in, in doing your, your models, such as GDPR and where the data is stored and depending on jurisdictionally where these individuals are located. But I wonder if it, I think it'd be helpful to comment about that because this has to be adaptable to different jurisdictions and different use, ca use cases around the world. Yep, Th thank you, Mike. Uh, indeed, uh, and again, here this shows the flexibility of the model. The model does have a component, does have one of the 11 element that is exactly about compliance with rules, with regulation, with applicable standards that may vary country to country. So in our case, as I mentioned before, the United Nations being an international organization is not subject to a specific national legislation, nonetheless, within the privileges and immunities, the UN itself built a structure framework of policies or procedure or requirement that uh, are represented by, of course, by the UN Charter in terms of hierarchy of norms, by the General Assembly resolution, by the Security Council decision, as well as at the administrative level, by the uh, Secretary General Bulletin and administrative instruction that regulates and that are applicable to all the operation of the United Nations. So in so doing, by addressing that specific element of the BMM, we refer to the applicable requirement and norms to demonstrate compliance within the UN system. So that when the oversight bodies of the United Nations, being the internal auditors, being the board of auditors, being the uh, advisory committee, being the governing body will question whether, how, and when we were in compliance with the UN rules and regulation, we were able to demonstrate that indeed there was a discrete step in the process that required us to check, verify, and confirm that the mechanism, the control that had been put in place were in alignment with those norms. I'd like to complement uh, at this point uh, just by adding a couple of uh, uh, important considerations. Um, normally, the UN does not make any reference to local laws, first because it's a, an intergovernmental organization that has 193 member states, but also because um, um, whenever there are member states regulations that are referred to, those have substantive provisions that very often are relevant, but also procedural provisions that involve uh, enforcement actions and um, other administrative measures that the UN would not be able to comply with because of the uh, inviolability of its documents, of its, as uh, of its assets in, in accordance with the UN Charter, but also the 1946 Convention on Privileges and Immunities and the 1947 Convention on Privileges and Immunities. However, as Dino um, correctly pointed out, it is important for the UN to take into account um, um, uh, national requirements when devising its policies and procedures because of the standards that are put in place. And that's why the BMM is so important because once you have a, um, a high level standard that the UN but also other government organizations and private institutions, uh, non-governmental organizations, that the entire um, uh, community can um, reach, then you have an important standard that is also, that is also relevant when funding sources uh, entrust uh, funds to the UN. So for instance, even in cases where um, they can't be referenced to local legislation, Donors such as the European Commission will carry out pillar assessments and other kinds of assessments before transferring any funds to institutions um, 
um, that you know uh, could potentially expose them to substantial risk. Uh, so I hope this clarifies the the, the the query that you had. I think we are close to wrapping up. Um, I I wanted to ask uh, for final remarks from those who are here uh, in in Kyoto, but also uh, from the colleagues online. And I I personally wanted to conclude just to say that. Um, I've heard many ways, you know, to describe the model today, but certainly the one that I uh, I personally like the best was the game changer reference. And I would like to also highlight a very important dimension, which is how the system um, ensures that the sustainable development goals can be reached. And so I'd like to have some thoughts about it from, um, uh, the team here, and also I would like to ask if people in the room here have any questions. Uh, Dino, why don't you uh, give us some thoughts on y the intersection between the model and the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals? So, well, w one of course uh, of the <laughs> is the term identified as sustainability. So what we have discovered, what we were able to demonstrate, for example, in the specific case of the United Nations Pension Fund, is that by digitalizing a manual process using blockchain technology as well as biometric, as I explained before, we have been able to cut substantially a lot of manual processes, a lot of uh, paper-based processes, a lot of uh, scanning um, tasks that they were previously conducted at the fund, along with archiving. So because of the manual support of a process that for 70 years uh, ran and asked people to sign a piece of paper, 84,000 people, return that piece of paper to the UN Pension Fund, the organization had to equip, to equip itself with a system of verification, of validation, of archiving. So by just introducing this technology, we have substantially cut the amount of energy, the amount of space, the amount of labor that was involved in this process, and definitely, I think, demonstrated with tangible result that this is a sustainable solution. I, I can share. I can share one other and that is uh, the concept, uh, and I, I don't remember if it's the SDG uh, 16 or 17, but it's the, it's the one that talks about strong institutions. Uh, I think it's peace, justice, and strong institutions. And, um, you know, the, the BMM didn't just uh, kind of come out of thin air. It actually was developed uh, uh, from, from who we are as an organization and, and what those things that are, uh, that are important to us. And to give you an example, when we started the Government Blockchain Association, the very first thing we wrote and the most important thing on, on our website is our ethics statement. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, just share my screen and just tell you what this is, because this really is the underlying foundation of where the BMM uh, came from. Um, it says the GBA commits to reflecting various viewpoints and positions from many perspectives among its stakeholders, uh, among its members. Yet technology like an inanimate object is neutral regarding human motivations. Therefore, the following tenets will guide GBA leadership and its members as we engage with public policymakers, industry influencers, and citizens at large. And these were numbered, but that's all, I'm just going to number them. That's, that's how I know them. One, technology is a resource that can and should be globally used for good on behalf of all citizens. Two, the resultant uses of technology, such as blockchain technology and related innovations, strive to improve, to improve the quality of life for all citizens. Three, Governments, government employees, and laws are instituted by citizens and nations to serve and protect, not suppress, not suppress or hinder the free and positive pursuit of the governed. Four, the inalienable rights and dignities enjoyed by citizens shall not be unduly suppressed by the authority of governments as they carry out their mandated role and responsibility. And finally, GBA will only pursue goals that, that serve to form a more perfect union between and among governments and the citizens they serve. We do this by establishing justice, ensuring domestic tranquility, providing for the common defense of citizens' rights and welfares, 
and securing the blessings of liberty in a free society. And those are the tenets that that were the foundation that blockchain was built on top of. I'm sorry, that that the, the blockchain maturity model was built on, on, on top of. So if we go to look at what the SDGs are, right, and what where they connect, well, this is very similar to what the, uh, the United Nations uh, is looking to pursue, right? It's really about establishing a, a long-lasting peace. And I, I believe very firmly that uh, that what we're attempting to do really aligns with all the SDGs, because all of those SDGs, in part, connect to the mission of of the GVA um, and the UN. And I think the blockchain technology is the enabling technology that allows us to to build those strong institutions. So that's how I think that the uh, they connect. Do you have a question? We have a question from a gentleman in, in this room. Sure. Would you mind introducing yourself? Yes, please. Hello, uh, good morning. My name is uh, Ashem Songwe, and I'm a member of parliament from Malawi, but I also, most importantly, I'm a member of the African Parliamentary Network on Internet Governance. Sitting in here as a gate crusher, uh, uh, I've been very much uh, intrigued, I mean, but also enlightened by the, the presenters on the subject of the blockchain. And also my view and understanding on the matter has also been broadened, getting to see that in coming from the public sector and being able to understand how blockchain could enhance uh, public sector reforms in service delivery and uh, uh, notwithstanding the attainment of the SDGs by the UN, what was most fascinating is the, as presented by Dino, the use case uh, in terms of pension fund management. And uh, I'm also mindful of the uh, various social protection programs that the uh, uh, member states of the UN are involved in in their respective countries. And one of the critical issue that they uh, come across with is the positive identification of the beneficiaries. And Dino said it's difficult to prove a negative. <laughs> so it was quite a very, very enlightening. And the point I want to raise as a lawmaker, there are serious uh, gains to be made from uh, if countries were going to adopt uh, this kind of technology. But you know the issues of mistrust. But I think uh, Shona did also uh, lay off those uh, uh, fears that the blockchain does offer the platform that is can be trusted, uh, provides traceability, and also is transparent. But uh, these are the issues that are not being communicated uh, to, uh, to the governments, so the governments can start uh, uh, transitioning into digitalization transformation. As a lawmaker, I represent the APNIC, as I said, the General Secretary is uh, over here. Would appreciate to have some kind of uh, working relationship because some of these issues eventually they will have to be translated into legislation. Either would um, uh, accelerate policy enactment or legislation enactment that would uh, fast track the adoption of uh, these kind of technologies. At the same time, another question going to the uh, UN United Nations. We're talking about of, um, a, a deficit of 2.6 billion people that are not connected. But at the same time, we've made a decision that um, uh, digitalization and the internet governance and the um, information technology is the way to go. We are not going back. It would be appreciated if the issues of the SDGs could also be supported in terms of encouraging countries to enact policies that are going to utilize blockchain as an accelerator towards the attainment of those uh, goals. So I don't know whether this is something you would consider as UN, as parliamentarians, we'll be simply waiting to enact laws, but we need is, uh, we have some uh, capacity uh, uh, areas that should be uh, improved upon. 
as I said, uh, through the APNIC, uh, uh, to which I'm a member. It's quite enlightening, and thank you so much for allowing us to get crushed uh, into this uh, very important session. Thank you. Thank you. Th there's a very easy yeah. comment oh, I'd like to can make. We let, can we, oh, guys, well, can I, we I was going to say, let Amelia, let Amelia handle this, because she is a lawmaker, and I think we that she's right. Gerard, sorry. Yeah. Gerard, we, we reached the end of the, our time, a lot of time. So let's please allow people to ask the question. At least we all hear the question, then maybe we take it offline, because it's 11. If 15, it's the end of our session. Yeah, if one of you guys will give him my contact info, I can show we him will. the model legislation we that we've run. We will, yes. Okay, we absolutely. Will. We have one more question. Yeah. Uh, thank you all. I'm uh, Lee McKnight, Associate Professor at Syracuse University School of Information Studies. I'm here now inviting you all to get up and join my class at 6.30 a.m. to hear about a sustainable development blockchain my students are building for the U.S. Department of Agriculture, but that's an aside. We can take that offline. Uh, the question is, um, I've heard a lot, obviously, the name's Government Blockchain Association, and I applaud the work being done, but there's also research industry. You're in this multi-stakeholder forum. What about the rest of the world? What's the interface between the rest of the world and the Government Blockchain Association? Thank you. Yeah, that's an easy answer. Uh, you should join jupiterglobal.org, and we will definitely help uh, resolving the issues that we've heard today. Everybody is welcome. I know time is not our best ally. I'll just use half a second because blockchain is still very much associated with cryptocurrency. I don't know how you're going to break that and get it off the minds of the people. And of course, when you talk about cryptocurrency, we know of people who have lost their money through that. So I don't know what you're going to do to ensure that you break that, you know, um, that, that, that that association of blockchain with cryptocurrency and mistrust. So very quickly, we are over time, so apologies to the coordinators of the room if you allow us to, to just one minute. My name is Sarah Opendi, a member of parliament from Uganda. Uganda, thank you so much. So th first and foremost, thank you everybody for participating both in person as well as online. Very quickly, the name Government Blockchain Association definitely refer to government, but also is intended for all citizens or all entities that work with government and for the government. So it's not limited to government, actually entities, private sector, really the multi-stakeholder philosophy approach of the IGF is mirrored in the GBA. It's open to all representative of all sector, industry, civil society, academia, and, 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 and NGOs. Uh, in terms of breaking that association blockchain and cryptocurrency, there are over 50 working groups in the GBA that address way over the use case of cryptocurrency. As alluded to before, we have working group on digital identity, working group in digital asset, uh, working groups on the supply chain, healthcare, artificial intelligence, voting and election. So really we go very well beyond that. And the point is, is really training and awareness. There are two conferences. One usually takes place at the end of September, October, and one in May, that are really have a, a wide uh, variety of topics that are discussed and presented by practitioner and representative from the multi-stakeholder community. Thank you very much. We can definitely continue this conversation, both offline, in person, as online. Thank you. Thank you.